Athletics are the closest thing most human beings come to contemplation, to the highest of human activities. It may lack the seriousness of contemplating the highest things, such as philosophy or music, yet it contains a liberty and a joy of its own that can only be had if we seriously engage in the play before us. You know, there's a you know, sports figure, especially basketball, that Bas was my favorite sport. There's a time in playing basketball when you get in these zones. You just can't miss the basket, no matter what you do, your body, your being, if you like, knows how to shoot that ball. And it just goes in. And when you're in that zone, other basketball players that are good know that, God, that player's in a zone. Uh, we got to interrupt that. <laughs> We're gonna get beat here. Uh, well, that's a weird experience to have, to feel yourself acting out of your being instead of acting out of your, I should make this shot, I missed the last shot, and I want I, I, I need to make this one, and so on, you know. And, and if you're running a business or if you're uh, giving a talk like this, there's a difference between operating out of your being in relation to other beings who are operating out and operating out of things I've assembled in my silly mind only. Well, e ego is something you've invented. You see, your ego is a construction you put together to kind of approximate who you are. Uh, so it is, there, there are different signals. Yeah, there are different signals coming from my approximations and my actual reality. So uh, a lot of what comes from my approximations doesn't work out. And so living from your ego runs into challenges that uh, clue you that you're living out of self-constructed delusions. But, but when you're acting out of your being, you're sort of in, invincible. That, that is, there's nothing can stop you from acting out of your being. Uh, death itself doesn't seem to stop you. You can act out of your being right through the whole experience of dying. When we stop opposing reality, Action becomes simple, fluid, kind, and fearless. In the long run, optimal experiences add up to a sense of mastery, or perhaps better, a sense of participation in determining the content of life. That comes as close to what is usually meant by happiness as anything else we can conceivably imagine. I developed a theory of optimal experience based on the concept of flow, the state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. The experience itself is so enjoyable that people will do it even at great cost for the sheer sake of doing it. Everything we experience, joy or pain, interest or boredom, is represented in the mind as information. If we are able to control this information, we can decide what our life will be like. What we're pointing at is a dynamic that a fellow by the name of Dr. Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi has spent the last 40 years researching and collaborating with other researchers and institutions around the world to study this dynamic of flow and how is it that we have those moments, those experiences of oneness where time disappears and where we experience being connected with whatever it is that we're involved with and through whatever it is we're involved with with all that is. Dr. Csikszentmihalyi, when he was a teenager growing up in uh, Europe after World War II, his aristocratic um, Hungarian family had basically lost everything. And he was fascinated to observe how some people really were destroyed, not just externally, but internally uh, by this uh, experience and uh, turn to all kinds of despair and self-destruction, whereas other people in precisely the same social and economic situation 
seemed to thrive and seemed to find happiness. And he decided for, with his life he was going to go study happiness. And uh, came to the United States, became a psychologist, a professor at the University of Chicago, and a social scientist, and has been extensively studying the question of flow for 40 years now. And this, this is uh, one of Dr. Csikszentmihalyi's charts. What he has uh, discovered over time is that you and I experience anxiety, we experience stress. When it is, up here in quadrant one, uh, when it is that the, um, the challenge is high, but our skills are low. Then in those situations where uh, we experience apathy in quadrant two, that happens when uh, the challenge is low, but our skills are low as well. We just don't care. This transitions over into quadrant three where we experience relaxation and boredom in those situations where our skills are very high but the challenge is low. We fall asleep. But it is only in those situations where the challenge is high and our skills are likewise high where we bring together a high challenge with high skills that we then have the opportunity to enter what you've heard talked about as the zone, which is where flow happens. And that's the only place where flow happens. And it's that dynamic that keeps us growing, keeps us learning, keeps us evolving, keeps us becoming. And you and I tend to stay in environments where that's happening, and we leave environments where it's not happening. Challenges and skills and flow are very much integrated with who it is that we are as human beings. We are fundamentally flow beings. We flow, we move, we circulate. Every cell in our bodies vibrates. That's what we do, we are flow beings and flow is always a part of our reality. It's always available to us, but you and I are not always available to it. We disconnect uh, from that dimension, that reality of our lives. Am I meeting the immense challenges of my life with well-practiced skills, delivering me to growth, evolution, and becoming? Or am I caught in stress, anxiety, apathy, and boredom, while disengaging from the real challenges and opportunities of my life? I am intrigued to enter more deeply into the flow of my life. Journey with me as we explore the practices leading to flow.